Angela? All right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Susan Eastland. I'm here at Cary on the adult programming team. Um, I just want to thank first the Cary Library Foundation. They enable us to bring um, amazing programs like tonight's to you. And I want to say thank you to Brian from Maxima. Um, he's here with some of Jenna's books. So please support at the end. I'm sure Jenna would be happy to sign them for you. I know I'll be doing that at the end. Um, so we are recording this program and it's going to go up on YouTube later for anyone who missed it. Um, and so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, Jenna will be talking to us about her memoir, Woodrow on the Bench, and then take us through a little workshop. Um, Jenna Bloon is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of novels Those Who Save Us, The Storm Chasers, The Lost Family, and memoir Woodrow on the Bench. She also does audio course, The Author at Work, The Art of Writing Fiction, and the original podcast, The Key of Love. Jenna is one of Oprah's top 30 women authors and CEO co-founder of digital author platform, The Mighty Blaze. She lives in the Boston area where she has taught novel, fiction, memoir, and marketing workshops for writers for over 20 years. So we are so happy to have Jenna with us tonight and please give her a warm welcome. Every time I hear myself introduced, I'm like, who is that? <laughs> it's sort of an out-of-body out of experience. But thank you for the intro and for importing me here. And I do want to thank the library. I think libraries are not just places to get books. They're also like nuclei of a community. So I'm glad to see you all here with CDs and DVDs and books and notebooks and pens. Like, I still write old school that way. So thanks. Um, and also, Brian, thank you for coming and bringing books and selling books. I like, guess I will happily sign books for everybody, for yourself, for everybody else. I'll sign other people's books. I don't care. I love to sign books. So. I bought my pens. I'm ready. Come on in. You can sit in the front. I promise they won't bite. It's a little bit like teaching. I used to teach at BU, and everybody like gravitated to the back until all those seats were full, and then they came and sat in the front. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about my memoir, and I always think of it as a memoir because I feel like there's something very like Zsa Zsa Gabor about writing a book about yourself, essentially. As you heard in my introduction, I'm a fiction writer by trade. I have three novels, and I started out writing short stories, and they were all fiction. And I have to tell you that I never intended to write a memoir, and I also never aspired to write a memoir, and I will tell you why. And I love to read the genre. Like, I've been reading memoirs since, I don't know, I could sneak, like, all my mom's Erica John memoirs off her shelf. <laughs> Um, and I started reading memoir and nonfiction because I wanted to know how to do life. And I feel as though every memoir, I mean every book really, but every memoir especially is like a torch that a writer holds up on a rocky path to show the reader how to get through that particularly challenging situation, or at least that's why I started reading them. So as I said, I read Erica Jong to learn how to be a lady writer because I didn't have a lot of those role models when I was growing up. And I also read Pam Houston for the same reason. Um, I also read, I made a, like, a little list for you guys, Ann Patchett. Um, I love Ann Patchett's essays very much, and a lot of them are about uh, starting out on that career path. I read William Styron's Darkness Visible when I wanted to know about depression, um, and Kay Redfield Jameson, who's a doctor and a memoirist about mental instability, because that's what my second book was about. And then for another book, I started reading Augustine Burroughs and Caroline Knapp to see what it was like to be an addict who then gave up drinking. Um, and so anytime I was going through something or was researching something that was challenging, I would turn to my fellow and sister authors and read a memoir. Um, Cheryl Strayed, obviously, I think is like the queen of memoir, right? And so um, I read Wild when it first came out after reading her excellent novel, Torch. And then when my mom got sick and had breast cancer, I read it again. And then after she passed, I read it again. So I feel as though these writers have become friends in a way, like really showing me how to research difficult things and then also how to navigate difficult things in my own life. And you can imagine why I didn't aspire to write a memoir because I thought, who am I to do that for anybody? Like, who am I to hold up a torch on a path 
and tell other people how to do that thing. I didn't think that I had a situation in my life that would apply itself well to that kind of book. And it's not as though I didn't have difficult situations. I did. Like, everything on my social media is true, and it's also the tip of the iceberg, as Hemingway says. It's like 1% of my life, and then there's 99% of my life that I don't talk about. And there's some really challenging stuff in there. But I still didn't feel as though I had a situation that was really containable, that I could put my arms around, and that would teach people something new about that situation um, until about 2018. And then my old dog, my old black lab, Woodrow, who at that point was 14 years old, got sick. And he was, um, after uh, 14 years of having him, I got him when he was eight weeks old from a breeder. And when he was 14, he started to breathe like Darth Vader. He was like, oh, you know, you could hear him coming from several rooms away. And I took him to the Angel, um, the Angel Memorial, which is an excellent vet hospital, and his cardiologist, because of course my dog had a cardiologist, like a Californian. He also had an acupuncturist and a nutritionist and all the other ists. His cardiologist gave him only a few weeks to live and said he has congestive heart failure, it's not gonna get better, it can be managed, but you should be prepared to make that difficult decision. And I was like, Okay, but like when is that, you know, when when does that happen? And he's like, you just need to, you know, it, it will be soon. I'm like, yeah, but that's not going to happen though, right? And he's like, yeah, but it will be soon. So um, my dog, and I will read you a tiny bit so you sort of understand what this book is about, and then I'll tell you like why I wrote it and how I wrote it and give you tips for doing the same thing. Um, I'll read to you like a little bit from the prologue. So Woodrow was like the common denominator of my life. Like he was like out and said, my north, my south, my east, my west, my workday weekend, Sunday rest. Um, and I, again, had him since he was a pup. So this is like sort of toward the end of the prologue. When I first got Woodrow, I didn't even need glasses. That's how long ago that was. Over the next several years of owning Woodrow, many things happened. I published my first book. I went on tour. I moved out of my postage stamp apartment on Beacon Hill and across into a bigger place across the public garden in the back bay. There was another novel, another tour, another teaching job. I split up with my boyfriend. There was another boyfriend and another. The men came and went like the women in the room in T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Woodrow, however, did not go. When everything else changed and went, he stayed. He was my structure, my laughter, my companion, my travel partner, my responsibility, and my daily joy. I was aware, on some level, that it was perhaps not the brightest move to invest all my emotional eggs in one basket, that basket being a canine who, unlike a human child, would not outlive me, who would, in fact, almost certainly predecease me. I tried to ignore that every year for a human is seven for a dog, and that when Woodrow turned six, he was really 42, and when he was eight, he was 56. I was affronted that year to learn that he was considered to be a senior dog. And when he was 10, I found my first evidence of that. I was applying his flea and tick medication on his back when I saw in the thick black fur on his spine a single white hair. A clang of alarm sounded in me, distant but distinct. I had lost my dad, so I knew what that sound was, the warning of mortality. I smoothed Woodrow's fur back down, hiding the white hair. Never mind, kooks, I said, using my nonsensical nickname for him. Has any dog ever consistently been called by his actual name? We won't tell anybody. It'll be the secret hair. Much of my happiness and my stability was predicated on my old dog. And when I thought about Woodrow crossing the river, I thought of heading toward Niagara Falls in a barrel, the inevitability and the precipitous drop. I wasn't at all sure I would survive it. This is what happened. So that's the prologue. It kind of explains a little bit of why I wrote the book that I thought, OK, this is a situation that I haven't seen anybody else write about in a memoir. It's something that I know a lot about, which is the caretaking of a dog in his final year. Um, who's really a beloved family member to me. And I think maybe I could help other people through that. It's such a tender time, it's a really tough time. A lot of people who aren't dog or cat people or pet people would say like, it's just an animal. Like, 
what's the problem? You know, but I knew there were a lot of people who said, no, like this is this animal is really important to me. So I thought, okay, I can write a memoir, perhaps. So I started thinking about it as soon as I found that first white hair on my dog's back. And then this is what happened. So remember Woodrow was given a few weeks to live by his cardiologist. He lived seven more months. And I'm convinced that the reason is because of the bench across the street from my apartment, which is why the book is called Woodrow on the Bench. Every day I would carry my dog in a harness and he weighed 80 pounds um, down the 13 steps from my apartment down to the street and across to this bench, which was as far as he could get. Um, we would sit on this bench on Commonwealth Avenue morning and night in every weather, in every season, and Woodrow would hold court there. I mean, Woodrow was called the George Clooney of dogs. I did not give him that nickname as a proud mom. One of my friends gave him that nickname. And it was really true, like he had his George Clooney gray, he was very elegant, he was very long-legged, he had a tuxedo collar, and he had great charisma for a dog, even when his eyes were cloudy and he had like four teeth left and his breath could kill a horse, he still had this great charisma. He had riz. So, he would employ his riz by lying next to this bench, crossing his paws, and tractor beam people in toward the bench. And I'm sitting there with my laptop thinking, I'm gonna get so much work done out here, you know, while he just sits here and everybody oohs and awes over him. I got no work done for seven months because first the dog tractor beamed in neighbors and friends who came to sit with us. They bought us food, they bought me coffee, they bought Woodrow carrots because he loved carrots, which he would like gum with his four teeth and like scatter in every direction. They bought him bacon. Um, and then they would sit and keep us company and tell me stories of their days, like what their parents were doing. Or my friend Jacqueline, who was like dating, it was like the bachelorette, she would bring me all her dating stories. And then um, everybody went on vacation because it was summer. And so I was like, well, now I'm going to be all alone on the bench with my dog all summer. And he started tractor beaming in strangers. So people who had come to town for the 4th of July or because it was August or whatever, they would see this old dog sitting next to the bench and they would say, oh, can I pet your dog? And they would come over and pet Woodrow. Um, and then they would sit on the bench and tell us about their own dogs, but also about their lives. So it was like humans of New York, except for the dog. So people like there was this um, one couple who was celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary who'd never been to Boston before. They spent the anniversary on the bench with me and Woodrow. And the guy got down on his knee like with great difficulty because he was like 90, but he like read a love poem to his wife that he had written for her. And they stayed with us on the bench, had champagne. Um, one day a whole sorority came and sat with us on the bench because they're like, oh my God, your dog is so cute. Can I pet your dog? And then they just stayed. So um, Woodrow's Instagram was like full of these encounters. There was a, a beautiful Italian woman who came and sat in the dirt with my dog in her white jeans and she cried and cried. And he put his snout on her leg and gave her the Jesus eyes. And she was like, he has such a special soul. This one I can just tell. And her boyfriend like finally dragged her away apologizing. And I was like, don't apologize. This is the Woodrow effect. And I was so struck by this because at the time, it was 20, 2019, and the country was so split with hostility and hatred, so riven, the whole world was entering into this really hateful period. And it didn't matter where people came from, it didn't matter what part of the country, red state, blue state, city, country, what country in the world they came from, they saw this old dog and he was the common denominator for human goodness. And I thought, that is a memoir. That is a story worth telling. It's not just about my love for my dog, which is considerable, or how he propped me up. It is about the fact that an old creature can do something that is so much bigger. So that is how I came to take the risk of writing a memoir. And I should have said at the outset, like, please feel free to interrupt me at any point or ask questions, like raise your hand, like, I'm here to serve you, like I'm your pet writer for the evening, so I'm here at your bench. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions or any comments, like at any time, feel free to let me know so I'm not just talking at you the whole time. And I'll leave time for a question and answer as well toward the end of our program. Um, so does anybody have any questions so far? 
Yes. Not a question, <clears throat> just a, com <clears throat> a comment. I'm a dog lover too, but um, I think it's so interesting. All, I wasn't expecting to hear all the people that swooned over the dog, and that could be a whole other memoir in and of itself. It, uh, I know the dog was the center, attracted them, but I think of all the kindness that these people showed. And, you know, some you didn't have one negative thing to say about any of them. I didn't. There wasn't one mean person who ever came to the, like that's that was astonishing. He was like a, had a little superpower that he could negate anything that otherwise might have been negative, which is what I think animals do for us that they negate that negativity. Um, and it's interesting you said that. So the comment, which I will repeat, is that it could be almost a whole another uh, another memoir all of the people who came to the bench. And in fact, that is what this is about. It's really about the people as well as about the dog. But I had to structure the book in a very specific way so that it didn't get boring and it wasn't just like a conveyor belt of people coming to the bench because that would get old and repetitive, right? So now that I've told you what this was about and why I felt compelled to write it, which was really about love. I know it sounds very hokey, but you'll often hear people say, write what you know. Absolutely true, but I think you should also write what you love, or write to the heat, but the heat is usually where there's something you love, whatever that thing is. And I love the dog and I love these people, and I thought, all right, I'm gonna take a shot at it, my agent's gonna kill me, you know, she's not a dog person, my editor's not a dog person, I've never written a memoir, definitely gonna do it. <laughs> um, and so I thought, okay, I'm gonna sit down, and here's the how-to of how I wrote this. And I'll give you my, my journey with it and my tips and hacks. Keep in mind that every writer is different, so there's no one right way to write anything. And if anybody says, you have to do it this way, you should run away from that person. But here's how I did this. I took, um, I want to say I wrote the first draft in a month because I draft quickly. And before I did that, I sat down and I thought about the structure of this book. I have a container sore brain. I know a lot of writers write only as far ahead as they can see in their headlights and they, they write down everything and then they organize it afterwards. I have to organize it first. I like to have a basic blueprint for what Melville called the long deep sea voyage of writing a book, although he was talking about Moby Dick and I'm talking about this slender memoir. Um, but still, I always think it's good to have a sort of a map so I don't sail off the edge of the world and write you know, for 800 days and 800 pages per day. And I do this with the understanding that that outline is going to change. So I literally will take a pen and paper and write down the chapters in as much as I know them, right? Like, here's what I want to say. Here's what the book is about. It's about my old dog and all this love he brought to the bench. That's like just the mission statement. And then here are the chapters as far as I can see. And I'll literally just make a laundry list. That's my outline. So when I say outline, I'm not thinking like scary Roman numeral outline like you used to see in like grade school. It's just a laundry list of chapters. And the Woodrow memoir, it was, as I said, like a little bit of a challenging thing to structure in that way because I thought, well, I could do like a Humans of New York thing and just have us sitting on the bench and each chapter is a different person who comes to the bench, but that is going to bore the reader significantly. Like I really need a beginning, a middle, and an end, like most traditional stories. So I started thinking about how his situation, the heart failure um, that he sort of began his illness with and then the end of his life, it was something that I call the containable situation. And this is something that I'm gonna give to you guys as a tip. If you're writing about some big situation in your life, like the love of a dog, think about like what containable time bracket you can put that in that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna start this book when I get this diagnosis, and I'm gonna end the book when Woodrow crosses over. So PS, if you are a dog person and you don't want to read a book in which the dog dies, which like all these people on Amazon are like, I read the book but the dog dies, and like it says on the jacket the dog dies, sorry, but you can just skip the December chapter. <laughs> but I um, thought, okay, the dog lived seven months after that diagnosis, I'm gonna have seven chapters. Each of the chapters from May to December is gonna be a different lesson that he taught me. And then the people on the bench who came to us are gonna be interstitials in between each chapter. 
So each of the lessons sort of builds on itself in terms of the traditional narrative arc, beginning, middle, end, right? So I start out like not knowing how to do any of this, not really knowing how to take care of this old dog, not knowing how to do it by myself, not knowing how to ask for help and having to learn to do that, not being able to accept help and learning to do that. So each chapter has a title like that, like you are not invisible or um, have the best day ever or believe the impossible, let people in, all the things that the dog taught me. And the last chapter is called Letting Go. And then um, in between those chapters, there are these little essays and each of the essays is about a person or persons that we met while we were on the bench. So you don't have to structure a memoir this way, but I would encourage you to think about what, um, what is it in your life that you love enough to really want to write about and then what situation within that beloved thing lends itself to a contained structure? Is this making sense? Like, please feel free to ask questions if you want. Okay. I'm gonna encourage you guys to ask lots of questions because otherwise I'm just gonna like sit here and look at you like I used to do at, at BU when I was teaching. Um, yeah, so, that is pretty much the, the structure of this book. When I pitched it to my agent and my editor, I said, this book is basically like Tuesdays with Maury, except with a dog, like teaching all of the lessons and then all of the people. And then it was just a matter of writing it. So once I had my outline written down and I wrote it on um, sheets of typing paper, taped them together, taped it to my wall, every morning I would get up an hour earlier than I usually did and write a scene from one of the chapters until it was done. And the way I write, and again, you don't have to do this, but I find it helpful, because I had that outline and I kind of knew like what I was gonna be writing on any given day, I then mapped it out to my calendar so I could see, okay, like Wednesday, I'm gonna be writing this, this part of the June chapter, and then Thursday, I'm gonna be writing the end of the June chapter, and so on. And I would build in time around um, each chapter so that I could have human days as well when I wasn't really writing anything because I find it's helpful to have like a human buffer. So that's kind of my process. Like when you hear people ask in readings, like what is your author process? I'm like, that's my process. I get up and I write things and then I take days off basically. Um, but that was how the book got written in a month. Um, and then I gave it to some friends to read. And it was basically the sort of progression of Woodrow's illness and then how I cared for him and the people that we met and my friend Mark who read this book um, was sitting with me at my dining room table and he said you know I have a question about this which is why were you all alone on the bench with your dog in the summer like why why didn't you have somebody to help you like drag him up and down the stairs and I said, well, you know my situation. Like I was divorced, I had just broken an engagement, I don't have any like teenagers who I could force into service. You know, it was like that was just where I was in my life. And he's like, that's what needs to be in the memoir. And I was like, no, it really doesn't, it's about my dog. And he's like, no, actually that's what needs to be in the memoir. You need to be in the memoir. So um, he was right, much as I hated to hear that. And I realized that when I write fiction, I, the author, have to be hidden. Like the worst thing you can say to somebody in a fiction writing workshop is, we can see your hand at work. And like, that's how I was trained, right? Like on my MFA, and people would be like, we can see your hand at work. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but when you're writing a memoir, you have to do something that I call more underpants, which is like, you have to reveal your own vulnerability in the memoir and really show the reader your underpants. And it's not the good underpants either that you wear on date night. It's like the old underwear that your mom told you not to wear in case you get into an accident. Those underpants, like that is the kind of thing, like that emotional vulnerability is what connects with your reader. And that sort of daring to say like, this is how it felt to me in this moment because that sort of humanity, like from you to your reader, is what makes you connect across the gulf of one human to another. And I had the great privilege of interviewing Cheryl Strayed um, during the pandemic on um, my author platform, which is called A Mighty Blaze. And I asked her about this and said, how did you go from writing fiction to writing your memoir, which is so disclosive? Like, what is the, the lesson that you would give to your readers? And she said, you know, 
tell you a story about this. When my mom passed and we were scattering her ashes, like I wrote this, it's in Wild. She said there was a moment in which I, um, when we were scattering her ashes, I tasted some of them. I put some of them in my mouth. And when I was writing the book, I thought, maybe that's too much. Like maybe that's really gonna turn readers off or freak them out, but it happened. And it was something that I myself wondered, like, is this normal? And it was such a high voltage moment that I put it in the book. And she said, that is a moment that I get most of my reader email about in that book. It's not my first husband, it's not the heroine, it's not the hiking, it's people writing to me to either say, that was horrifying, or, oh my god, I did that too, and I thought I was the only one. And I feel like that's why we write memoir, to say to other people, you are not the only one. You are not the only one who feels that way. So that kind of vulnerability has to be encoded in the memoir as well, as, as tough as that can be. And I would say, if it's something that you personally don't want to have out there or have any doubts about it, don't put it out there. But if you do, I think it will connect with other people. So you have your own sort of barometer there. So I went back and I shaded a lot of myself into this memoir. And those are the things that people write to me the most about. Like, I will have people write to me and say, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have any role models for being a woman on my own with a dog doing my life, and now I do, and thank you. And I'm like, but the book is about a dog. I guess it's not. So um, after I went and shaded that back in, I sent it to my agent, sent it to my editor. Um, then it took another like year for them to put it in production, and it came out in 2021 between Delta and Omicron. And I went out on tour with it with my new black lab, whose name is Henry Higgins. And, um, the rest is history. So I know there was a question over here. Um, yeah, maybe I missed it. How long, when did you start writing this memoir? Maybe you said that I missed that. I don't think I did say that, so thank you. So um, the question is, when did I start writing this? I started writing it in 2020, um, and uh, Woodrow passed in December, and I had had all these notes, um, and I also, while I was sitting on the bench with him, I was thinking, I probably will write about this someday. Um, and so I, I will tell you that as, as well as keeping a sort of a journal, at that point, what I was doing was recording everything on Woodrow's Instagram. Because I'm pretty active on social media. I'm like that rare writer who actually loves social media. Woodrow also was active on social media and still maintains a social media presence from beyond the grave. So um, whenever anybody came to the bench, I would say, do you mind if I put this on my doc's Instagram? And so I had this great visual diary of material to draw from. So when I went to write the interstitials of the people who visited us, I could go to his Instagram and say, oh my gosh, there is this amazing Muslim woman who came and said, love is love, or like the Italian woman, or um, the sorority, or the couple who had their anniversary with us. So. Uh, yes, I started writing in 2020, and the same time I started my company, which was like a sort of certifiable lunacy, but it kept me busy, um, and it, it didn't take that long, actually. So, good question. What other questions do you guys have? Yes. Um, thank you for sharing the vulnerability part, because that's the hardest part, in terms of what's, where's the fine line being like between oversharing and not sharing enough, like a, not enough to really touch other people. I mm -hmm. always find that difficult. Mm -hmm. That is a really good question. What is the fine line between oversharing and not sharing enough? When I teach social media classes also for writers, and the number one um, phobia about social is that people don't want to like compromise their privacy, right? And they say, okay, that's why I, I, I hate being on social. Like I'm supposed to go on and show underwear on social also. And I'd say anything that you feel like you might want to stick your hand in the mailbox afterwards and get it back, if you're like that nervous about it, I wouldn't post it. Because even if you erase something, it still kind of lives out there in the universe forever, apparently. And I feel the same way about the memoir, except the great thing about a memoir is while you're writing it, you can go ahead and edit it out. So I would say trust your own inner barometer there. It's important to be honest 
But if you feel like, okay, this is something that's going to keep me awake at night, knowing that it's out in a bookstore somewhere, um, then I would reserve that. And also sometimes things to protect people's privacy if you want to do that. Like, this is the other question that people often ask about memoir because it's nonfiction. So you're writing about real live people, right? Like, this is often a problem because those people might read your memoir and they might not like that portraiture that you did of them. So um, I was smart, like I wrote about my dog who can't read and also is dead, so can't read doubly. Um, but there are people in the book who are alive and one of them is my ex-fiance in this book who begins and ends the memoir. And he's a really great guy, but I had to explain why he wasn't around for this whole experience. And I was really nervous about that. And there's a whole passage in here about like why we got unengaged or like un unfianced. Um, and I gave him the book to read before it came out. And the explanation in the book is that he is a photographer, he's a Nikon photographer, and didn't like staying in the same place. He was like fairly nomadic. Um, and said to me at one point, like, what if I just contribute some sperm and then you have a baby and I'll come and visit you every few years and we'll just have a relationship like that. And I was like, this is not gonna be a marriage. Um, and so I put that in the book and he read that and he was like, you have to put that part in the book. And I was like, do you want me to tell other reasons why we're not engaged? And he was like, you can put that part in the book. So um, if you are able to share what you're writing with the other person so that they don't feel ambushed, I feel like that's important. And I know that many of us write memoir because we've been in a situation that was painful in some way or traumatic and that that person or people who hurt us are not going to agree with what you've written. So then what do you do? This was also a question I asked Cheryl Strait. So, I was like, look, Cheryl, you know, you're writing about people who aren't alive, are alive. How do you handle this? And she said, pretty much if you are putting your own honest point of view in a book, people are not going to agree with it because it's your point of view. And you have to question, A, whether you can handle the consequences of somebody else's displeasure, and B, what are your motivations? So she's like, if you're writing a book to hurt somebody, I would advise you not to write that book. If you are writing the book to tell your point of view and you're writing it with love and you're writing it with respect for yourself first and then as much as you can for that other person, then I would say go ahead, but just understand that that person might be unhappy with you, like there might be fallout, there might be consequences. So that's kind of like the, the number two most frequently asked question about memoir is like how do you handle writing about real people. So I hope that that is helpful, as, as well as the vulnerability part. Good questions. Yes? I'm curious about your, you said you drafted the whole thing in a month. Mm -hmm. That's kind of And I just wonder, if, was the revision then in a month? Right, so my draft, my first draft is in a month, and was the revision a month? No. So I always write my books really, really fast after thinking about them for a really, really long time. Um, so I sit and ideate them forever, and then that's why it's like five years between books, because I'm thinking about them, but then when I sit down to write, they come out pretty clean. So the first draft is always fast, because I've been carrying the book around in my head for a while, and the revision takes usually like three to six times as long because then you're trying to get right the thing that you got wrong in the first place. So I feel like that first draft is kind of like a, um, a Pollock painting where you're just throwing everything that you've been thinking at the wall and doing the best you can to make it perfect, but nothing is ever going to be perfect the first time, which is a bummer. Um, and then you go back in and you clean it all up and make it into a Monet, which is what you intended to do and not a Pollock at all. So the revision always takes longer and there's always more than one revision. I usually go through like 11, and I'm not exaggerating, like 11 drafts of each book and then it goes to my editor and then it goes through a series of editing um, processes. So yeah, don't don't think I'm a wunderkind of some point, some, of some stripe, like I'm, I'm really not. It takes a long time to write a book. So if it's taking you a long time to write a book, you're doing it right. So a couple of like tips that I want to give you guys, and again, I wanted to um, ask for any questions along the way, but here are some things that I think might be helpful to you. How many of you have already started 
writing a memoir. Okay, cool. So there's like a little like V, like a bingo V here, which is great. So those of you who haven't but are memoir curious, I would say um, think about the, your subject when you're trying to figure out like what am I going to write about. This is what I call the so what question, because all of us have interesting things in our lives. All of us have high voltage emotional experiences. All of us have challenges. All of us have some sort of knowledge to offer. And what I would say is, what are the three most interesting things in your life that you want to write about, that you yourself want to write about and find interesting? Forget if other people would find them interesting, but like, what are the top three things that you yourself find the most interesting and that you love, the things in your life that you love? So I'm going to give you just a minute to write down those things. Um, and then those of you who already know, you can take a tiny nap for like a minute. Does anybody want to share one of these? What you're thinking of writing about and why? Go ahead. Um, I'm going to just share one. OK, yeah. But I put down running because I'm a, like a marathon runner. And I already did this short piece on running and suddenly came to some place, but I haven't heard back from them yet. And it's so hard to write about running because it's not a story. Mm -hmm. Like so, how to create a story about writing is, is something I have to think hard about. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So you can write about running, and I think that when you're sort of sieving your life for topics that you love, it helps to think about something that you have a lot of knowledge about, or some specialty, or um, an extraordinary situation or circumstance that you might have had that you want to share knowledge about. And if you're a runner, of course, you want to write about running. And the question is, like, why and what? Like, what is the story there? So that's actually my next piece of advice about any of these subjects is to think about, is there, and remember I said this about the Woodrow memoir, is there a containable situation in that subject, within that subject? Like, is there a situation within whatever you're writing about that had a beginning and a middle and an end so that you can find a story in it? So one marathon, that was really difficult. Or training for a marathon in an unfamiliar place. Or training that taught you something. Or how you started running, how you ran, and how you finished running. That kind of thing, right? So um, what are some of the other subjects that you guys came up with? If you want to share them. 
Obviously, I approve of this. And she's like writing about fostering rescue dogs. Good. Obviously, lots of love, like dogs running, lots of love there. Do you have a containable situation? Yes, I can imagine. I love that. I hope this title is the first 50 dogs. <laughs> I would buy that book. That's really great. Good. So there's a sort of a marriage of like subject of love and then the first 50 dogs out of 375 dogs by now, I imagine. Good. Yes. My son won some goldfish uh, at the carnival. I didn't even know I was getting myself <laughs> Yeah. Are you overrun with goldfish? No, it's more the work and how big they get. <laughs> I, just, I just thought, oh, it's simple. You put them in some water and feed them. No, it's a whole thing. See, I did not know this. I would read this memoir because I didn't know this about goldfish. I'm thinking about like my 1970s going to the fair, you know, you knock some milk bottles off a ledge and you come home with a fish in a bag and put it in a bowl until it dies, forgive me. I, this had happened to me when I was young and I was thinking about like writing like either a children's story about it or a magazine article. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Good, yeah. I think that makes sense. And what you guys are saying are, are thinking, making me think about, um, the subjects are making me think about form, too. Because not every subject has to be a book. Like if you have a goldfish-sized subject, you might want to write an article about it. The same principles apply, right? Like you would have a subject that you found interesting or funny and were really plugged into, and then you would have to find a containable situation, like the first 50 dogs, or something to do with your running that you get to decide um, or like bringing your first goldfish home and then what it taught you but that might be an article as instead of like a whole book unless you bring home 50 goldfish in which case you could have the first the first or the koi pond or like whatever right yes the second subject uh, i should have finished the writing and have a 50,000 words about divorce and dating. About what, sorry? Divorce and dating. Oh, oh that sounds fun. <laughs> but the challenge is where to end because it's still ongoing. Right. Yes, it could. you could write forever about divorce and dating, I imagine. You could probably just write about being on one dating app forever, swiping endlessly, the book that never ended. But you hope it has a happy ending of some sort. Um, that's a great question, and this actually is sort of epitomizing my point, which is if you don't have an end to the story yet, it's probably not a story that you're ready to tell quite yet, right? Like you have to wait for an ending to the story. That's the containable situation. Another piece of advice that I could give you is it's sort of a conjoined piece of advice, and one is that you have to have some emotional distance from the situation, right? So if you went through your divorce yesterday, and you're like, I have to write about this son of a bitch because I, I don't, I'm gonna go run over with my car. Fair, that's called journaling, um, but you might not wanna make that into a memoir yet, so you might wanna journal about that and take your notes and like do your Instagram you know, records and whatever, and return to that situation when you have some emotional distance from it, not just so that you have like temporal distance and some healing distance, but because then you know what lesson it taught you. Like you know what you're trying to say with that. You know what lesson the goldfish taught you. You know what lesson the 50 dogs taught you or the running, right? Like I know what lessons the dog taught me. And I often feel as though when we're in the middle of experiencing something really intense, we know there's a lesson. Like you sense there's a lesson up there in that endless dating app and the divorce, right? But you're not sure what it is yet. That's usually a sign that you're not quite ready to write that thing, but that it is an excellent subject to keep in your sort of library of things to write about because it has that heat and it has that interest. You just need the containable situation and you need the lesson, right? So my second exercise for you guys, and just take like a minute to do this, is choose one of your subjects and write 
a containable situation attached to that subject. So when can you think of a time during all that dating when you might have a beginning, a middle, and an end? Like when you could find a story attached to that, or the running, or the goldfish, or the dogs. Um, the dogs, if you've got 50 dogs, then it obviously is like a good container. But um, write down, just for one of your subjects, what is the situation that has a beginning, a middle, and end within that topic? While some of you are still working, does anybody want to share a beginning, middle, and containable situation story attached to your subject? Go ahead. Uh, one time when we were falling asleep one night, I heard this like explosion sound. Like, and then just all this water, and I thought maybe there was a flood coming in from my upstairs neighbor. In reality, the fish tank, the 29 gallon fish tank, I cracked open on the bottom oh and flooded the whole entire living room. Oh my God. <laughs> that is a horror. Your son is like, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's a horrifying situation. Oh, yeah, but um, I learned a lot about like the sanitary problems with it, the wood floors got damaged. And just human kindness, um, because PetSmart did replace the whole tank, but I had to lug it just myself from the car, and it's extremely heavy. Um, but they did get a new tank out of it. I was going to say that sounds like an uncontainable situation with all the water <laughs> flooding everywhere, but it turned out to be containable, at least temporarily containable. And what I love about what you said is it is one story with a beginning and a middle and an end, but it also has a lesson to it. And the lesson is about human kindness. It's not just about how to save the fish or like how heavy the fish tank is. And so I'm encouraging you guys when you're choosing your subject to write about, think about the lesson that that story taught you. Um, it's something else that you get to do in a memoir that you don't get to do in fiction, which is to say, this is the point of this story. I think of it as like, remember that show, The Wonder Years, which I kind of grew up watching, and at the end of every episode, there was like a moral, and so the narrator would be saying, and then as I stood watching the men walk on the moon, I realized that our lives would never be the same. And so in fiction, when I'm doing this, if I'm writing that out, 
it means that I have to go and take it out again afterwards and let the story speak for itself. But in memoir, for every chapter you write or for every like, piece of writing that you do, you should be able to say what that lesson is. And it's okay to leave it in, just like the underpants, which is great. So if you're like, and then I learned about human kindness from, is it PetSmart or Petco? Pet PetSmart. PetSmart, okay. So PetSmart taught me about human kindness. Like that is a great sort of last paragraph lesson for this memoir. Memoir let, small memoir. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So this is the final thing that I would advise you to do is when you choose your subject and then you also think of a story attached to that subject, whether it's a big one or a small one, if you can see the lesson attached to it, like internet dating is great. You should never give up hope, even if you think something is totally impossible, like voila, any, something good can happen at any time. If you have that lesson, um, then you can write the memoir because you know what you're trying to say. So you're really looking for three things. Like you're looking for a subject of enduring interest to you, love to you. You're looking for your containable situation, which lets you know there's a beginning, middle, end, like you're not still in the middle of it, you have some emotional distance from it, um, and up to see from space that lesson that's attached to it, because that's gonna get, give the whole thing its so what. So I'm gonna give you one more minute to write down about whatever it is you're working with, what is the lesson inherent in that thing? Like fish, tank breaking, human kindness. Boom, memoir. to admit, I love watching people write things after so many years as a teacher. I really love it. And does anybody want to share the that trio subject story lesson? Thank you for the fish example. summarize the lesson even though it was not explicitly explicitly pointed out. Um, the lesson was you don't run for yourself, you run mm -hmm. for others who can't. That's a great lesson. So the lesson is you don't run for yourself, you run for others who can. Thank you. What was the situation? Oh, it was the Chicago Marathon I just did, uh, not just did, I did in October. My friend and I were supposed to share the hotel room but uh, after we landed in Chicago, uh, and then in the um, process of having like a car load <laughs> before the, the run, she received a phone call from the hospital, her father was in the hospital. And so she immediately came back to Boston and missed the run. So I was thinking to run fast enough so I can qualify for next year so that I can run with her for her needs. That is a good, that's great. So you have the thing you love and the story and the lesson, which is great. Yes. Back row has a lot of of the things going on back there. Does anybody in the first two rows want to share a situation? Something you're thinking of writing about? Or do you want to keep it a secret? I know sometimes with writing, it's like you have like a little candle that you have to hold like really close. And if you talk about it, then the flame goes out, right? So if you're protecting the flames, I totally understand that. But I hope that this is helpful in some way in terms of helping you decide what you want to write about, 
how you want to write about it, like what that form takes, and then what the point of it is. That's pretty much what all writing is about. I mean, if you have those three things, you can write anything. So I'm wondering, I hope I have been helpful in some ways. Do you have questions about anything? This is the time to ask. Can I ask any, any writer question at all? Yes, and then I'll You mentioned questions. something about happy ending. Do you feel like it needs to be some sort of happy ending or soft ending, or does it matter? Does it need to be a happy ending? No, only in a romance novel, only in genre. I mean, my dog dies, does not mean, although there's a sort of a softer ending to it. Um, but uh, I think that good writing in general reflects life, whether it's fiction and you're bouncing it through a prism of story, or it's nonfiction, in which case you're replicating something that happened. And not everything that happens in life is happy. And so if you're guiding your reader through something that's difficult, in fact, like most of the memoirs do, because happy people make for short memoir, you know, <laughs> make for very short stories, like one sentence. All happy families are like the end. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be a happy ending. But I think if you have a point to what you went through, it makes it worthy for your reader. Like if you have an unhappy and pointless ending, then that would probably be too much to ask of your reader. But I think if you're saying like, I went through this terrible thing, but here is the point, um, then the person has learned something that makes it worthwhile. Yes. Oh. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. I'm just curious about going back to writing about people that are alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that? What is your opinion about either changing the name or <clears throat> making it sort of anonymous? I mean, nowadays with Google, people can search search people out. And if you're telling a true story, everything is true but the name. Mm -hmm. And maybe just as a first name. Just what would that be kosher, in other words, in writing a memoir? Totally. Can you change the names of people? Absolutely you can, completely. And you can say that in the text inside of the names have been changed yeah. here to protect people's privacy. I think readers actually expect that in some ways from memoir. I remember reading like articles in like Glamour magazine when I was a kid at the doctor's office or whatever, and there were always for these the true life stories. Um, it was the asterisk, you know, names have been changed. It was pretty much the case for just about every story in Glamour. Um, but um, yes, you can totally do that. And there's always a, a sort of a publisher's disclaimer also yeah. um, at the beginning of every memoir that you will have gone through you know, a significant legal process of vetting. Another question. Yeah. I don't know if there are other questions. Yes, yeah, we'll get to all the questions. All right. Yes. Is your opinion about what tense to use mm. when you're writing? In other words, somehow the present tense makes it more, um, you can get more involved. And if you write then in the past tense, it sometimes can drag. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering your, your opinion about what tense to use. That's such a great question. What tends to use past or present? So whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, I always say present tense is the tense tense. Because when you're reading something written in present tense, you, the reader, don't have the knowledge that the character or person has survived that experience. So you're really strapped into that experience with that character, whether that is like fiction or not fiction. Um, and so if you want to give that experience to your reader, you can write in the present tense. If you write in the past tense, you allow yourself a little bit more narrative distance, like more temporal distance. So you can um, sort of like go right into the moment and then zoom back and say, you know, 18 years before that, this happened. So you have a little bit more latitude to move around in time when you're using the past tense. Now that I think about it, I had actually like not even thought about this, but in Woodrow, I, I flipped between past and present and the chapters in which I learned my lessons from him are all past tense and the bench interstitials are all in present tense. And that's because I wanted to imply that like, if, you're, if you were on this bench today, 
you can still meet like this conveyor belt of people. Like it will always, it's a situation that keeps eternally renewing itself. So that was why I made that choice. And that's, it's a great question. And it changes the, um, the tempo of your story a little bit because the present tense can often sound a little bit more dreamy and um, a little bit slower in some ways. Um, and the past tense is that traditional storytelling, you know, once upon a time there was a princess who lived at, with an evil stepmother. So if you want a more traditional sound, you would go with past tense. And if you want something that can sometimes be interpreted as a little more dreamy or poetic, but also puts the reader right in that experience, you would use present. Yeah, you can try it, test drive it, you know. But it, it does convey like a certain, um, like a certain rhythm by osmosis to your reader. Somehow tense would be more sort of immediate. Yes. And you can you can feel that you know the, the reader will feel that they, as you say, are in it. Yep. While if it's in the past tense, then you're an observer. Mm -hmm. And being an observer, then you know it loses some of that 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 uh, I guess connection. Yeah, the immediacy of yes. that. That's true. So yes, I think you should write in the present tense. I think you say, I think you want to write in the present tense. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I usually write in the past tense, mm -hmm. but I'm realizing that present tense is probably the better tense to be using, mm -hmm. um, even though things have happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, and, and I guess the other thing is, obviously, it doesn't have to be chronological. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So Doesn't have to be in some ways, you know, having it zoom around is probably a little more interesting, but it, it, it demands more of the reader. Mm -hmm. This is why, so a memoir doesn't have to be chronological. No story has to be chronological. I think the writer has to have a chronological understanding of the story and then know why you're arranging the pieces in that way, in a kaleidoscopic way, because it can confuse. The reader, which is why if you're telling something out of sequence, there has to be a reason, and this is when I would extra advise working from an outline. Um, I, I know a lot of writers who will write chapters on index cards and move them around, you know, or like attach them to a clothesline and move them around and do these sort of storyboarding things. Um, so you could have that as well, but just so that you know why you're telling it out of sequence. And I do think, like, how ironic to take something that happened 50 years ago and make it present tense so it's immediate, it's actually a really cool tactic because you're allowing your reader to time travel into that immediacy of that experience by using that tense. So that's really good questions and observations. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I think I'm time for like a couple. Actually, I'll answer all the questions. But um, since I know we're coming up on time, um, if you have to leave, it will not hurt my feelings. Too much, a little bit, not too much. <laughs> Now, first, that's been a great presentation. Thank you. I've oh. learned a tremendous amount Thank from you. yourself and also I'm just impressed yeah. by the number of people who are already well into this. I feel like a, I've slipped into a class that I should not be in, it's like a graduate <laughs> class. But I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get my mind around it because mistakenly, I'd assume the memoir could be just one event mm -hmm. and you just write about that one, like the running, the marathon, and that's it. When you then add to it, well, now you've got to say, well, what's the lesson? Mm -hmm. I, yes, it's going to get far more interesting, but <laughs> but the memoir could be just the event itself, or am I? Are you? It like, could. Just saying. It could be a short memoir. <laughs> it could yeah. be a long memoir. It could be a short think, story. Or it could be a short story. It could yeah. be. This is what we were saying a little bit earlier. It could be like one essay or one article. Like yeah. if you. My best example of that, again, is Ann Patchett, who has series of books of essays that she's written, and each one is about a different event or a different thing or a different topic. And you could also do something like, let's say you are writing about one event, um, just like, give me an event to work with, like, throw an event at me. Running marathons, so yeah, yeah, I'm going to try to them, so. <laughs> this, uh, I'm in the graduate running class. I see. So um, yeah, it's good that I can't write. I'm on like a lick, basically. I can walk really well. Um, so yeah, if you're going to run the marathon, one of the things our author in the back could have done is instead of writing about this one, she can write about this one event and use it as a backbone for a larger story. So let's say she gets to Chicago with her friend, but that first chapter could be 
in addition to like arriving in Chicago, like what is the nature of the friendship? Like, let's say that that first chapter is like 20 pages about that friendship. And then the next day they get up and they're like going for a practice run. I know that's not the right term, but then it could be about like, how did we train for this? And the chapter could be about that. And then there's like a chapter on carb loading, which would be my favorite chapter. And then that chapter would be about like all of the sort of nutritional stuff that goes into. So you can pull information down into what looks like a short or a simple story just by breaking it up into chapters and expanding those chapters. Um, so you could do it that way, or you could write a shorter piece about running and how to be 20 pages in and of itself. And the way you would choose that is how interested are you in it? Like if you were gonna write about a marathon, would you just write about that one marathon in that lesson? Or would you yourself wanna make it into a much bigger piece that's still like a book that's still about that lesson like you run for people who can't but do you want to expand it by bringing in other information about the whole process but, so but to, to make it meaningful you you have to put some hook in it showing your vulnerability it's not just like well let me just give you a day-by-day -day -day account of how i prepared for this there's got to be something there to say why is someone else going to be interested in just reading your log book of Preparation. Yeah, that's right. Okay. You're totally right. Yes, it has to be something that, that you learn something from that shows some vulnerability because otherwise you're right, it's a great description. It's a log book. When you think about travel logs, right? Like travel logs are not necessarily interesting. You're just reading somebody's travel diary unless something happens on that trip that is like yeah. A, an interesting dramatic situation in and of itself and B, means something to that person so that they're different when they finish from when they started. And that's basically what it what the determining factor is. I imagine like with any marathon you probably learn something, you know, and it probably is different for every runner and it's different for every marathon. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be my guess. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does totally. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a pain, right? You have to have all this stuff. All this stuff in a story. I remember when I was teaching at BU and I would make people do character descriptions and they'd be like, Okay, we're done. I'm like, No, you have to have something happen. In the story, and they were like, "Why?" I'm like, "Because that's a story. Otherwise, it's a vignette." And they're like, "That's such a pain in the neck." I'm like, "I know." And then it has to mean something. And they're like, "Why?" Ah, <sighs> go watch TV. Yes. I, I was, I was just thinking about your uh, "so what" question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you could talk more about that, I'd appreciate it because I, I don't. Um, I'm thinking about writing about something that means a lot to me and it, but i feel like so what you know i mean so what if it means a lot to me um what's the hook why this story now you know that kind of is there a reason you want to tell that story i kind of don't want to <laughs> it's kind of a painful story. Um, the purpose for me would probably be to to make it containable for me, almost. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I think that's a beautiful reason to write it, but you might not want to share it publicly, and that's okay. There are a lot of stories that we all have that we don't share that are still great stories that we write for ourselves. And sometimes in the process of doing that, you find another story that you do want to tell. But you're also teaching yourself the difference between a journal story, you know, and something that you keep for yourself, or something that you want to share publicly. Uh, and yeah, in every life, you have both of those things. And you might find also in writing it that, that you do want to share it, and that's okay too. But I think it, that's a really important self-awareness, self-assessment thing to know. And it does not mean you shouldn't write it. It just means that you might not do something with it that you would with a different story. I hope that helps. I don't want to discourage you from writing anything ever, but you know, yes, it's just a question of, it's a question of audience. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean something just because you don't want to share it, you know? You can talk more. Or because it's so intensely personal. There's the so what thing of who cares about this except for me? You know, um, 
this can be more conversation. Yeah, it's a great conversation. I would say, and again, this is your comfort level as the author to decide whether to write about something or not. But if there's something that is intensely anything, intensely painful, intensely joyous, intensely dramatic, intensely whatever, it is going to translate for other people. Anytime something is intense emotionally on the page, because the author feels it, there will be people who will be able to relate to that. That is the so what, the intensity of it. So if it is intensely painful and you feel like writing about it, it might be a catharsis, or it might be something you share with other people that helps them through the same situation. That's your decision. But I think that is the so what. The intensity is the so what. Otherwise, you know, you could just be writing a log book. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a log book either, but you know, it has to have that intensity. I think you have your so what, actually. Well, could it, oh, go ahead. Maybe well, just to follow on to that, could you could you decide to say, well, okay, as much as your friend told you this, you've got to be more vulnerable, could someone read and say, you know what, you've got to you've got to pull this out. You're too vulnerable. Absolutely. Fine. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. If I had written something that was too vulnerable, I'm sure my friend would have been like, I am not even reading this right now. This is way too much. I have had people tell me in the past if I've written something that I'm going through and like thrown it out at people to read, one of my friends once said to me, like, this has too much heat. Like, this is too hot right now. Like, you need to let this cool. And I was like, you're right. I broke my own rule about not writing something while I was going through it. Or rather, I do that a lot, but then I also let it sit until I have that emotional distance that I was talking about. And sometimes I'll write something that is really hot, and then it's too much, and people are like, you don't have any distance here right now. So the intensity is important. Like If you don't have that, I don't think you really have like a story in some way, but I think that knowing that your relationship to it is the right perspective is really important too. I think there are some hands up and hands and hands and hands. Great hands. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what would you say uh, as the kind of the fundamental difference between a memoir and a diary or a book, like diary book? Yeah, the difference between a memoir and a diary is the diary is for you and the memoir is for other people, and as such. Make the leap or possibly make the transformation. Yes. So the transformation is structure. So the transformation is, okay, I lived through this thing, let's say eight years ago. Let's say I get a divorce eight years ago and I wanna write about that thing. Um, and I feel like I'm ready and it has been continuing to ping me, like the intensity of the situation is still sending me those sonar pings and saying I need to be written about, I need to be written about. So then you can go back to your journal, if you're keeping one, or your memories in your head. And then I would do the work that I was talking about of saying, okay, what is the, what's the container for this? What's the containable situation? If I wanna write about the divorce, am I writing about the whole marriage? Am I just writing about the divorce? Like, what is the lesson I wanna say here? And then I would sit down and try and identify the beginning, middle, and end of that situation and break it into chapters and start writing it. But I think art is like memory plus time, basically. It's like memory plus time plus work. So you're giving shape to something that at the time was just experience, and that is the difference between the experience and the sort of diary um, rendition of it and a memoir, which is really for an audience. So you're taking the experience and, and shaping it like an artisan to make it accessible to other people. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's all about, it's about like structure and um, really about shaping and structure. Thank you so much, by the way, for this. Oh my God, you're welcome. This is great. Yeah, I feel very inspired. Good. Um, but I just have a question. Do you recommend ever writing a memoir under a pen name? Sure. Change everybody's name. That's fine. I don't see it. I mean, honestly, I see no problem with that. You would have to go to an editor or an agent with your own name, but say, I want this published anonymously or under a pseudonym. Like, my name is Jenna Longpants now, you know, whatever. So, yes, you can totally do that. I'm touring with a book, I mean, that's mm -hmm. you. you know, so it's well, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, 
again advise you about that. You could get some very extensive plastic surgery or something, right? Um, but it is, I mean, I think about this a little bit. Like, I'm a marketer from my own books. I love marketing. In fact, I probably like it better than writing a lot of the time. And so I'm known as a marketer. And there's a book I'm writing now that's out of genre. Um, and so I'm like, well, what if I publish that under a pseudonym? It means I'm not going to be able to market it as myself. Right. So it's a consideration, but like not really. I think the important thing is that the book gets told and then um, and written and shaped, and then you go to a publisher with it and make that decision together. And hopefully your publisher is going to market it for you anyway. So um, even if you love marketing and getting out there and banging a drum, because so many writers do, um, then, you know, that's just, you'll still hopefully have some backing and some support. One sec, I'm gonna let this lady talk. Um, you talked a lot about social media. Yes. You teach a social media class to writers. I do. And your dog, in spite of going into the next realm, still has an Instagram account. He does. Um, what is the, is it imperative for a writer to have a social media presence? I think so. The question is, is it imperative for a writer to have a social media presence? I think it really helps. Um, because, because it's a marketing tool. It's a marketing tool, exactly. It puts the word out. It puts the word out, yes. And it might be limited depending on how big your scope is on social, but you can build that, and that's what I teach writers to do, to like create a presence and then build a presence. And do it in a way that's comfortable and doesn't feel like you're showing too much underpants online, because nobody likes that. I just wanted to know you said you teach, or they said in your bio that you teach at um, Grub Street. Are you still doing that? I don't teach at Grub as much as I did. I'm teaching a Muse session there, but now mostly I'm teaching social for writers and I'm running novel workshops that I've been running for over 20 years. I was running them at Grub, and now I'm running them under the Blaze, like because I have my own company, so I'm teaching under the Almighty Blaze umbrella. But if you're interested in anything, like email me and let me know what you want the class about, where you would want it to be, when you would want it to be, and I will accommodate because I love doing this more than just about anything. <laughs> really, I love I love teaching. I'm so glad. Yes, yes, it's all there. Are the classes online? They could be. This one will be. Yeah, so I'm, I'll just close us out quickly for our, our recorded audience. Um, I will be sending out a recap email to everyone that registered. If you didn't register, feel free to leave your email with me. Um, and so that will have all of Jenna's information on it. Um, books that we talked about, things like that, I can put in too if anyone missed anything. Um, thank you everyone so much for attending. And we'll just give Jenna a little round of applause. Yeah.